Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess a new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. But now, oh Adam, we will make known to you what came over us through him before his fall from heaven. He gathered together his hosts and deceived them, promising to give them a great kingdom, a divine nature, and other promises he made them. His hosts believed that his word was true, so they yielded to him and renounced the glory of God. He then sent for us according to the orders in which we were to come under his command and to accept his vain promise. But we would not, and we did not take his advice. Then, after he had fought with God and had dealt forwardly with him, he gathered together his hosts and made war with us. And if it had not been for God's strength that was with us, we could not have prevailed against him to hurl him down from heaven. But when he fell from amongst us, there was great joy in heaven because of his going down. For if he had remained in heaven, nothing, not even one angel, would have remained in it. But God, in his mercy, drove him from amongst us to this dark earth, for he had become darkness itself and a worker of unrighteousness. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen here on Revolution Radio. And I'm honored to announce that Gary Wayne will be joining us for three shows over the next two weeks, tonight, tomorrow night, and also next Thursday. We will be speaking about the fall of Satan and the general story and timeline of Satan this evening. And then uh, speaking about the books of Enoch and also the connections between the mighty men of renown and the Knights of Malta. So definitely you should want to tune in. Uh, I did post a link to the Discord chat where um, our group and will be fellowshipping. And if so, if you'd like to join us, please do go there. And for those of you that are listening live and that do not have access to that particular chat i'll pro provide you the link you can just type in uh https colon backslash backslash discord dot gg backslash vb capital v nine capital y n s and uh also if you'd like just go to my facebook page and you can find the show description and the link there as well. Gary, how have you been, brother? I have been excellent. I am enjoying the summer. I am at my cottage and really excited to be here with you tonight and with your audience. Awesome. It's a great honor to be with you as well, brother. And I know that the, the listenership really enjoys when we come together and discussion and... Um, so where is your cottage at? Well, I'm from Canada, if the uh, audience will recall. And I live in Vancouver, but my cottage is a long ways from Vancouver. It's in a one of the smaller population provinces in Canada called Saskatchewan. And if somebody were to know where Regina is, it would be about a five-hour drive. Straight, and it's on a nice uh, fishing and swimming lake. Lake, uh, just outside of Prince Albert National Park. Awesome. That sounds really great. What a 
what an incredible place to be able to go to write and spend the summer as well. Are you are you there for three months or so? Or yeah, I'm here till the end of August, and uh, hopefully. I'll uh, get some good time to start, uh, you know, uh, working a little more deeply on on, on my second book. I've uh, kind of stalled out with how busy I've been in the last year. So it's my objective this year to start getting at it so that I can uh, get it off to the to a publisher once I once I figure out whether or not it's worth publishing. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sure it will be. It's just a matter of uh, how many volumes it will be <laughs> after you're yeah, done that's... with all the research. That's just it. it is, and I want to keep it shorter so it's not such a uh, a trek for people to have to to read through like the first book. Although I mean, I, I love the product, and I'm glad we did it in one book. It, it, it's a I'd like to do uh, you know the second Exodus and the Holy Covenant into one book, and and you know, again, but again, try and tell the whole narrative right from uh, uh, you know the conception of the Holy Covenant and the covenants and the curses, and then the second Exodus. Awesome. So it follows basically uh, when you speak of covenant, are you talking about with Abraham or are you going all the way back to Adam when he was banished from paradise? Yeah, dealing with all of the covenants because the, the covenant with Israel is sort of an aggregation of all of those other covenants just as Absolutely. it incorporates the covenant with noah so yeah i think it's important to sort of walk those steps up to this eventual covenant with uh, abraham and then with israel fantastic i know that's going to be an incredible book um you also mentioned as well that you will be tracing down and sharing your research on the lost tribes and so i guess in guessing that's going to be the latter portion and uh, the final paragraphs or I mean final chapters yeah I'm wondering whether or not that actually needs to be a separate book so that I don't right. put it into uh, too long of a book again because there's right. so many rabbit trails and so many different views on it but you know the sifting aspect of it for me isn't to chase down all of the rabbit trails and, and necessarily put it in the book. I want to sift it down to what fits with prophecy because mm -hmm. it either fits with, with what is in the Bible uh, or it doesn't. And it may be interesting, but if it doesn't fit with the Bible, it's kind of one of those things, you know, do you really want to, you know, get people confused by all the different theories right. that are out there? Right. Well, that's fantastic. I know that um, that in and of itself is a particular topic of interest for a lot of people and so I could totally see how your research on that would be enough to fill its own book and also um, be a topic that would be quite attractive uh, to the world uh, and the research community. Oh, and the thing is, is, you know, not many people talk about it. Nobody sort of realizes, well, not nobody, but most people don't realize how many prophecies and parts of the Bible deals with this and then the impact of Israel and of Judah in, in the end time right. and then how do you apply the prophecies to each of those and the awakening of Israel and so I think what it does it helps sets the chronology and the timeline and I think what people will find is is and I, I have certainly found it, that's why I want to you know put this together is it just fits like a glove with the rest of prophecy. But you have to distinguish between Israel, Judah, and the church. And mm -hmm. that's one of the keys, I think, in terms of my approach for understanding end time prophecy. Most excellent. Um, as far as the, the covenant book, um, any idea as far as timeline, you think in probably next year or early or later, or any ideas on that? Yeah. Uh, well, and you know the publishing uh, right, business, right. and yeah, it takes a while. <laughs> and hope, and, and hopefully to publish with you on this book, but we'll see. Um, it's one thing oh, to that get would be it, awesome. it written, and that's fe that would be feasible maybe by the end of the year or early into next year. But then you've got all of the editing process and typesetting and verification of the end notes and the footnotes and so that whole editing process um you know it can take up to two years 
right. hopefully it'll be shorter than that, but it can. So typically, though, you, uh, you know, from what my first experience was on my book is I should not expect it to go from, you know, submitting the, the manuscript to having it published in less than a year. So mm -hmm. that's just unfortunately the, you know, the time frame. But, you know, if it can be shortened by six, you know, by six months, that would be awesome. But mm -hmm. it's uh, difficult to to going it with that, those kind of expectations based on past experience. Well, I know um, if, it, if it did happen and you were willing to go with us, that we would certainly focus uh, on fast tracking, but also, you know, making it a quality product to get it out there. Because I know a lot of people have been looking forward to your new research and are excited about already what you've done and the amount of information that you've compiled and put together. And I'm guessing that it's similar that you are um, gathering in collection many of what are, you know, a lot of ancient information and research that most people are not familiar with and, um, and you know, bringing that to light uh, in this, you know, this time and yeah. this topic. Exactly. And I think that's why. I, I may look at just containing that aspect of it into sort of the the, the second book in, in 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 this sort of series and keep it to two. But um, because it, there is so much of that other stuff, as you try and go through that amount of history um, and the migrations of people, that's the other aspect. It's, right. It's not just you know where you know uh, even with other other tribes and races and nations around the earth. I mean, if they went into northwest Turkey. And first settled there, like the descendants of Japheth did. Did they actually stay there? Well, probably not. Some did, right. but right. they also migrated everywhere else. And then there's continued migrations, and there are patterns of migrations that um, are interesting. That seemingly, even though there's migrations over thousands of years, that there seems to be this pattern of people that have uh, a kindred towards each other. Each other tend to migrate together and to even if they have separated will come together in another region uh, of the of the earth and in another period of time so there seems to be patterns as i look at that as well mm -hmm. it's, quite, it's like looking at the weather patterns sometimes right right yeah absolutely uh well that's a that's fascinating i'm very excited to hear and to see uh, all of your information um but with regard for I mean, not that most people don't know you and aren't familiar with your work, but if there is somebody out there that doesn't know who you are, uh, can you go ahead and just announce your websites and your Genesis 6 conspiracy book where they can go and find and support your work and a little bit about uh, what it is about? Sure. If uh, somebody uh, is looking for my website and trying to find a little bit about my book, it's... Uh on a website called uh, www.genesis6conspiracy.com, Genesis 6 with the number 6, conspiracy.com. And on there, I've got generous excerpts on all 98 chapters. And it, it is a, a little over 800 pages that I edited down from over 1,100 when, when I initially wrote it. And it is jam-packed with information, but it's bite-sized with uh, Many stories for every chapter that are about, you know, four to seven pages long. So you can read one chapter at a time and it leads into the next chapter and will keep coming up as the book unfolds. And the conspiracy book is about um, the fallen angels who mate with human females in Genesis 6 in that account. And what happens as they partner with the descendants of Cain, obviously, to create these giants the mystical religions that they create, the secret societies that they create, and how they work together to usurp the antediluvian world and enslave the, the Adamites, which causes the first apocalypse, how these people's groups and organizations cross the, and how they reorganize after the flood, and again at Babel, and how they influence the early post-diluvian period, how they influence our history, all the way up to today, and what they're doing today, and to bring about the end time that they want to bring about in this this, this day of destiny as they look at it. So it, it is a 6,000-year uh, conspiracy investigation dots into what I call the House of Dragon, 
which is kind of appropriate for, for the also the topic that we're talking about mm -hmm. tonight. Right. And uh, if you want to contact me, you can get all, you know, email me through the, the and you, you can also order a signed copy off the website. You can also link into the Kindle version from the website or to Amazon.com or to BarnesandNoble.com. And you can follow me on, on Facebook under Gary Wayne or my group, the Genesis 6 Conspiracy, Gary Wayne. Uh, and I am putting out a generally once a week a, a very thought-provoking commentary or blog into all of these different subjects, and I try and keep mixing it up. You know, I'm currently working on one uh, on what I call the rest of the story for Isaiah 14 and awesome. uh, dealing Sounds with Hallel and the howlings and the serpent's root and connecting that into the other prophecies so that people understand that this is not, not only just a uh, passage about, you know, Satan in uh, Isaiah 14, 12, uh, but it's also about a dual prophecy. So you have prehistory, you have an ancient prophecy, and you have an end time prophecy, and that there are other prophecies in the Old Testament, and it's key to understanding Satan, and, and we're going to dig into some of that tonight. And you can also follow me on Twitter at GaryWayne63, at GaryWayne63. Absolutely fascinating. And uh, yeah, I think we should start with uh, Isaiah 14. Because Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, uh, for those that don't step outside of the canonical material, those are the two passages which reference and give us insight into uh, Lucifer, um, Satan before his fall, uh, and also to you know how he wanted to uh, be like the Most High and to assert the authority and the seat um, to establish himself. Um, in the sides of the north on the Mount of the Congregation. And so let's start there, because I think this is also, um, in, in going forward, we see that not he doesn't, he's not able to exalt himself because the Most High throws him down, casts him out, and banishes him here to the earth. Uh, but then as we read on further, we see in, as you said, the prophecies, and I think that this is also connected to what Yeshua tells us in Matthew 13 uh, with the whole parable of the kingdom, the sower, and uh, the garden, and uh, all of that. I, I think all of that is connected. So uh, let's start there, and um, and if you would, talk about the, the timeline, because in my work, and I know that you cover this in great detail as well, Gary, uh, with regard to the antediluvian age and the prior times, and um, I, like you, believe that Satan was banished out of the heavens uh, a very long time ago, and that the fallen angels were um, the ones that were responsible for even creating the megalithic cultures and the buildings and the, uh, all of the structures and civilizations previous even to the fall of Adam and the banishment of modern humanity over what is the last 6,000 years. And so if you would, uh, let's start there and talk about that. Um, I always take it back to Genesis, you know, even one with the separation of the uh, light and darkness and the war in heaven occurring, which led to the earth becoming destroyed, uh, an indistinguishable ruin and a deserted wasteland so if you would yeah i think uh you're you're bang on and i think we're in you know such similar agreement on those type of things and that i think that the angelic rebellion um does fit better between genesis 1 1 and 1 2 uh, uh, where somehow the you know, the earth becomes void, as in Tuhu and Boohoo, as you take that back to Hebrew. We're not going to do a whole show on this, because I think we've already done one. Yes, we have. And I have a handout for somebody, if somebody wants if somebody wants a, a breakdown on the renewal of the earth's theory or the gap theory, just get a hold of me through the uh, social media avenues that I mentioned, and, and I'll send you a copy of that. But I think it fits better there, because by the time you see Satan using the Nakash, the serpent, in 
Eden either uh, taking his place, either possessing them or coaching him from the side, whichever way you want to view the Eden account, he's already rebelled. I think right. it's pretty obvious because that's not his rebellion because you've got all of this rebellion details in the Bible that happened before. So yes. this is a sort of a manifestation that comes out of the rebellion that I also think Adam is. Uh, he is in a retort to, and also remember God is Alpha and Omega as Jesus is, so that none of this yes. is a surprise to Jesus and that right. he knows some of these angels are going to rebel. And in anticipation of that, he creates Adam, who uh, is going to have to choose God with very little information and not be around the throne like the angels are and Satan was, uh, and to uh, be loyal to God. It, and in return for that, will be raised above angels in the future. And so this works so well as a manifestation of the rebellion because Satan is obviously going to pre prevent uh, Adam uh, from having this happen to, to meet his destiny, so to speak. And so I think the rebellion, therefore, happens before. And so when we see the details in Isaiah 14, 12, I think this is the destruction that we see in Genesis 1, 1 to 1, 2. And the aftermath is, is that Satan is going thrown down from heaven. And then you have the renewal of the earth, and then you have uh, the creation of Adam, and you have all of this being played out with Satan being, you know, Lord of, uh, you know, God of this world, uh, because it's determined that he's going to be the accuser and tester of humankind, which is, you know, a partial meaning to his name. But I'm starting to get a little bit ahead of myself, so backing up. I think, that as you were saying, and I liked how you brought in what Jesus said, because there's, to me, there's a couple of keys in sorting out doctrine, prehistory, and prophecy, is that the first thing you do is look to what Jesus, as he is the authority both on the Old and the New Testament. Amen. And so if you, you look to what he says first, and then assemble all of the related verses around what he said. And if he didn't say something on it, then still arrange all of the related verses together because you'll find they'll fit like a glove, that they won't contradict themse themselves, right. that they'll give you a chronology and an order and a definition. You may have to do some work to assemble it and dig a little deeper in certain aspects, but I, I'm, I've not found conflicts. I only find that if I'm struggling with something, I just have to dig a little bit deeper. So yes. if you do that with prophecy and doctrine, it's easy to see how the Bible just sort of works hand in hand and, and never seems to contradict itself. But a few verses like, you know, selecting from a smorgasbord, then you distort the meaning because you're leaving other things out. And it's usually done because it's to promote a specific or a preconceived conclusion. And I think that's, you know, where we get into a lot of different issues. And so we there's a lot of different theories on Satan. There's a theory that there are two two of them, two Lucifers, one Satan, one Lucifer. There, that right. One is the offspring of Satan um, that they're talking about. And that's not really when you put everything together what you get. You might get something a bit similar. And I think Satan is the degraded form of Hail L. And Hail L is the Hebrew word for Lucifer. I and agree. Lucifer is is a Latin word. And if you in if you if you look at all the different translations, and of course Lucifer only shows up in the King James Version Bible, and I'll touch a little bit more on that in a few minutes. Um, you know, it translates as basically, you know, uh, a, a shy being the the morning star could be Venus in in, in some of the uh, uh, the applications, um, but you don't want to have that line read uh, like this. Uh, and 
this is why the translators, I think, kind of kind of struggle with it at times, particularly into English, is that, you know, you have uh, Hail El Ben and that's Hail El Son of the Morning or Hail El Son of the Dawn. But if you apply the meaning like some translators do, now you're going to apply something like Light Bearer, Son of the Morning, which is kind of saying the same thing, or Morning Star or Day Star, Son of the Morning, which is kind of the same thing, and it becomes a little bit redundant. And Lucifer, it shows up in, in Jerome's Vulgate Bible um, in Isaiah 14, 12, uh, but he also uses it four other times in the Vulgate Bible. And the Vulgate Bible, for people who don't know, is, is uh, translating into Latin for the, for the Roman, uh, you know, Greek and, and and Hebrew transcripts uh, to, to form a working document for, for the Roman church in their, in their home language. But it's used four other times, Lucifer, in the Vulgate Bible. I think more accurately than in Isaiah 14, 12, although I think what Jerome is doing is trying to apply the meaning because Lucifer is the Latin word for Venus or for light bearer. Right, and it right. And it derives from, from lux and lucidus, uh, meaning light, bright, and clear. So I think that's what he's trying to do. But when you move into Second Peter, um, two one one nine, um, he's actually going to use Lucifer there when it's talking about Jesus. Right. Right. That's right. because they're talking about the day star, and it's more accurately portrayed. As it, than what it is as Lucifer in Isaiah 14, 12. And I think it's because he didn't use it as a name. You know, you've got angels' names like Michael, which end in E-L. Uh, you have Gabriel. You have most angels ending in E-L, just as Hale is, uh, you know, I think an angel's name. And I think that's where we get a transliteration down through the times for Hell which is sort of how the King James Bible conflates the three different meanings, you know, of, uh, of Sheol and Gehenna, and uh, I'm trying to think of, of the other one, but there's three different uh, versions that all are basically talking about the same um, place in, in, into one word. So we have a Latin word that's inserted into Isaiah 14, 12, and you don't have, uh, have a, a proper... I think understanding of it, and, and then in, in the, the other translations, you have day star or morning star, but now that becomes redundant again. But I think if you read Hail El Ben Shakar as Hail El as an angel, son of the dawn, I mean, yes, that means um, uh, also Venus, which can be the morning star and also the evening star, depending on whether it's leading the sun or following the sun on the time of the year. So, right. I mean, that right. makes makes some sense. So I look at uh, Hell El as being uh, a, a more accurate translation. And if you understand that now, Hell El, who is degraded to Satan afterwards for his rebellion as the accuser and falling from heaven, now this makes some sense. Did you want to jump in there? Yeah, absolutely. And also, I just wanted to let you know, Gary, that um, some uh, you're going in and out on some of your words. So after the first break, I'm we're gonna I'm gonna bring you on and we'll try to reconnect and see if it clears it up. But it's only very minor. Um, but just uh, with regard okay. to yes, I agree with you. And the reason um, I don't accept that Lucifer and Satan are two different people uh, is because I've not seen you know multiple witnesses for that in Scripture and everything that I've studied. Uh, Lucifer becomes Satan the adversary after he is cast out and exiled. And Satan is more a term, um, you know, a description of the adversary, which is exactly what he becomes um, after his fall. And so I, I do agree with you, and I do um, absolutely concur that the war in heaven goes back to Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. And that this is the reason, and we've discussed this many times, that the earth, it becomes without form and point. That the Most High God did not create it in a manner that was broken or unfinished, 
um, and that Isaiah and Second Ezra tell us that he created it perfect and to be inhabited. And so obviously something occurred, and Scripture alludes to this particular war in heaven, and we see that even in Second Enoch, we have uh, the mention of, and one from out of the order of angels having turned away with the order that was under him, conceived an impossible thought to place his throne higher than the clouds above the earth, that he might become equal in rank to my power. And I threw him out from the height with his angels, and he was flying in the air continuously above the bottomless. And this was on the second day. And so we see it links together in connection with the earth becoming without form and void, and also with Isaiah 14, where he says that he's going to exalt himself above the stars and the clouds of God, that he will establish his throne in the sides of the north above the mount of the congregation. And that we see also in that passage that uh, God tells him that, Rather than you exalting and, you know, ascending up to the stars of God, I'm going to cast you down to the sides of the pit. And so he is exiled and banished and cast out of the heavens and banished here to the earth, uh, which is also what um, I read at the the opening passage, which is from the first book of Adam and Eve, chapter 55. And all of these things confirm uh, what we are talking about and describing with regard to the the casting down and the exile of Lucifer here. And again, we get three accounts of uh, uh, Hillel being cast down from heaven. You have Isaiah 14, 12. You have uh, Ezekiel 28, 17 to 18, which is that other verse that we're talking about, where it's talking about um, Satan as being the guardian cherub. Right. And, and, of course, you have, for me, the, the defining one in Luke ten eighteen with Jesus yes. saying that he saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Right. And what's very, very interesting about that is that, you know, the color red in, in Greek is, is uh, comes from the Greek word poros, G4450, and it's right. the color of fire. Uh, and it's rooted in G4424, which is fire and lightning. So everything just seems to have that sort of perfect symmetry. And a human could not fall from heaven, right? A human yes. hasn't walked amongst the fiery stones as described in Ezekiel 28. A human, um, uh, other than Adam and then Eve, weren't Eden as, you know, King Tyrus, which is the allegory there, um, being used in Ezekiel 28, and the Bible isn't in conflict there. Right. And just as you look at the meaning of Hallel, there's also a figurative meaning to it, which is H E L E L, as opposed to as opposed to H E Y L E L, is which is the king of Babylon, which is discussed in Isaiah 13 and Isaiah 14 in the destruction of Babylon. Uh, and this is also figurative that goes back to the true king of Babel in the prehistory to understand how this Satan rebellion of raising the throne to heaven is ha happening over and over and over. And again, will happen in Antichrist as recorded with Daniel and yes. also bringing some of the story host even down to earth, but with Nimrod at Babel, who tried to build a tower that would reach into heaven. This is a allegorical prophecy um, or prophetic allegory is a better way of saying it, of uh, what has happened in history as to how we're going to understand what happens in the end time and happens over and over and over again. And so Hallel is defined as the figurative king of Babylon or Babel, just as King Tyrus would be the same type of individual as Hallel and probably is the figurative of Hallel in Ezekiel. So you have in Isaiah 14 and in Exodus or Ezekiel 28, dealing with kings in a prophecy of their time, but also of a historical for reference and also of a prophecy of the end time. And most people don't realize Isaiah 14 is a prophecy of the end time if you read the beginning of it, just as it is a prophecy extension out of Isaiah 13, which is an end time prophecy. 
prophecy. Yeah, absolutely. And we also see that uh, we are told that Satan uh, had links to Pharaoh during Egypt uh, and as he was, um, you know, rivaling against Moses and Aaron. And so he has always been ruling through the different pharaohs and kings that are part of the New World Order elites, which give them themselves over to possession by him and through these fallen angels. And we see evidence of that in uh, the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, where it speaks about the, you know, the kings uh, being taken over by these particular, uh, these reptilian, the serpentine, seraphic, angelic beings. And, um, and so, yeah, all throughout these scriptures and all the other, um, what I found, it, it confirms what we are talking about. I think there's one other interesting passage that um, gets overlooked, and I believe that Psalms 82 also ties into this. And the how I what I'm specifically mentioning is is that where it speaks about God standeth in the congregation of the mighty, He judgeth among the gods, and then we see in verse five, they know not, neither will they understand. They walk on. In darkness, all the foundations of the earth are out of course. In my opinion, that is a link to Genesis 1-2, uh, where the earth is without form and void, and we see that darkness is over the face of it. And then we have the sentence, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. I believe that prince there is Satan, the prince of the air. Uh, and, then, and then it tells us that in Isaiah 14 and also in Ezekiel 28, that he will die the death of a man. And so, in my opinion, when they were cast out, the one-third of the angels that joined him in rebellion, they were put under the authority of death, and that will be deferred until the end of this 6,000 years uh, or the 7,000 years um, that after the millennial reign. Uh, that they will be annihilated as if they had never been, but uh, they certainly have been, in my opinion, put under the authority of death, and it tells us that Satan will die the death of a man. Um, what's your thoughts on that, Gary? Uh, again, in, in probably perfect uh, sync with all of that, because I liked uh, you bringing in, in Psalm 82, because I would if you wouldn't, wouldn't have. And also, Excellent. if people want to match up with these gods dying like humans in the Council of Gods, uh, also look to Isaiah 24, 21 to 23 in terms of how they're going to be dealt with. So and it's right. very, very consistent with Psalms 82. And this idea of gods within this world, and you talked about children of the Most High, that's, you know, Ben as in son, as you take that back to Hebrew. So these are sons of the Most High or sons of God as the same terminology as we understand Genesis 6. Uh, four as the sons of God being angels, and um, yes. and we we can go around forever in terms of how many arguments there are in terms of uh, of of these angels being called sons of God, but they're all are circular and mean the same thing, whether or not it's the host of heaven or it's the morning stars. Just as you've got, you know, the 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 sons of God showing up in Job who present themselves in heaven. Um, in one six two one and thirty eight four to seven, right. and of course that's where Morning Star also shows up. But they all define a greater sort of realm of the angelic order that that are in heaven. And of course, sons of God haven't pre or as humans haven't presented themselves to the throne in heaven. And what's key there is Satan also does it as a degraded. Hell, hell, presenting himself and accusing, as in his right. role that he's been ordained to do. And this is because, again, going back to what you're using with gods, and I'll, let's just throw in what Jesus was saying when he was accused of uh, blasphemy for uh, referring to himself as the Son of God, he referred back to Psalms 82 and yes. used that against them that if God says that there are you know, small g gods, then who are you to question that, right? Right, right? And so, and then that goes right into 2 Corinthians 4, 
where we understand that Satan is the god of this world world right so yes. again the language and the meanings are so neatly woven together and we understand also from ephesians that he is the prince and the power of the which is you know a, a spirit you know that is you know working for continuous Annual disobedience in this world to get humans to rebel against God, which is why we have so much prophecy and end time prophecy. And that uh, not only is he the prince of the air, as he's described, and a god of this world, he is called in uh, 12, you know, the prince of this world. And so you now you take prince back to Greek, and that's G757 for Arco, which is the first rank in power. Power, just as he's the prince of power or the chief ruler. So he's right. clearly being called the chief rebellious angel. And who knows, he may have been the chief angel at one time before his fall. Yeah. And you look at also that G758 that follows it is Archon, and that's the present participle of uh, Arco. And, and that's of being. So this is of being the first power as an archon, right? And this is what archangel is formed from, just as in Daniel 3, Michael is also an archangel. So we're understanding with, with all of this language is, is that one of the positions that Satan is, is an archangel. And in that, if we look at power, in, in Ephesians 2, 2, as G1849 excusa, that also means government and authority. So not only is he a god of this world, but he is also uh, an archon that was in probably one of the men, you know, seven angels in front of the Lord. But he's more than that before his fall, which tells us of this great sort of fall that he did, because when we look at Satan before the fall, and as likely as as Hail El, um, we see that he is called Cherubim in in Ezekiel twenty eight, and that's co is a covering Cherubim in Ezekiel twenty eight, and he walks amongst the fiery stones as a Cherubim. So now he's seemingly an archangel. Uh, and he's also cherubim. But he's also called, and this maybe just be in the degraded form, it's hard to know, the serpent and the dragon and the devil in Revelation 12. Right. And so seraphim in Isaiah 6, the six-winged seraphim is a fiery red, fiery serpent that ministers before the throne of God within the fiery stones like a minister or a priest. And, and so if the seraphim are ser a serpent form and Satan is a serpent and a dragon and the devil, just as devil, me, you know, a, a diabolos is accuser, slanderer, and prince of demons and author of all evil, um, an accuser with falsehoods, um, all of a sudden we seemingly have a possibility that he was also seraphim. So we're right. getting an idea with all of these different titles and positions that he is indeed was described as perfect before his fall and that he may have been the most powerful being next to the word of God, the spirit and God. Right. And that that's why he thought he pulled this rebellion off or at least win another realm uh, to be part of. So. And when we look at, at the jewels that he is wearing, he has nine jewels in Ezekiel 28, right. which the pri priests tend to wear, just as the seraphim in Isaiah 6, they pull out a stone or a coal from this, of the fiery stones of the Lord to take the sin away from Isaiah. So there's this priestly aspect, and also we learn in Exodus that 
the Aaronite priests are going to wear a vest only with 12 jewels, so three more than Satan, which eventually right. there's going to be another order of priests come out of uh, fulfilled in, in, in Jesus uh, uh, in the end time as the order of um, Melchizedek. And so he may have also been the high priest before God, before his fall as well. Yes, I, and I think there's allusions to uh, all of that, even in the extra biblical text. Um, uh, specifically, I believe it's the Gospel of Barnabas. Uh, it makes mention of um, uh, Satan as being the first created uh, archangel, that even before Michael, um, and then Uriel, Gabriel, and Raphael, and but you know again when iniquity was found within him and i take this also back to um, genesis 1 where it speaks about the introduction of light where god calls forth the light in my opinion that that was christ and when he was revealed and given authority and dominion over the uh, angelic hierarchy that this is the moment that iniquity was found within satan or lucifer and that's when he decided to tempt all the other angels um, to join him in rebellion and they allowed that to occur and then again when that war happened that's when he's cast forth that's the whole separation of light and darkness and the earth becoming destroyed without form and void and and then his rule we see is here upon the earth and that he is cast down to the sides of the pit and his domain then is within the interior of the earth, which is why we see in Job, where it asks him, where have you been? Uh, he says, I have been walking to and fro and up and down within the interior and um, on the face of the earth. And so uh, his domain is within the earth now. And uh, that's where we see, you know, the reference to Sheol and Tartarus and Gehenna and the other things that you had mention uh, all connect to Hades and uh, the underworld. Yeah, it was Hades was the one I was forgetting earlier when I was mentioning that. So mm -hmm. oh, thanks, thanks for getting that in. And the other thing is about Satan, and again, in terms of how high he fell, which is why that is such a, a perfect description in those three accounts that we gave previously in Ezekiel, Isaiah, and Luke, is that Satan is not only cherubim, but he's anointed, yes. which only we hear of Jesus as being anointed in uh, Isaiah 61 and Luke 4, which is interesting because that's, again, leading into Second Exodus uh, for, for prophecy. But um, So he's anointed, and anointed is, uh, you know, that means to constantly, create with oil to an oil right. and that's only done with kings and priests right and of course jesus is both so it's appropriate for for jesus to be anointed by god so this means that he is a prince or a king and a priest as well which sort of i know people don't want maybe want to think about him as being a priest before his rebellion but it seems that's how far he fell and yes. that goes also connect to um, 4473 Mimshok, and, and of course the oil anointing was uh, Mushok, uh, 4886. But this is uh, an expansion of outstretched wings that is covering, uh, in terms of a covering um, or a screening of the throne of God. So it, it, I think everything points to Satan as being such a powerful being, you could conceive why other angels might just think he might be able to pull this off. And Absolutely. It, unfortunately. Right. Yes, his and attraction so was so is, great that they thought that he actually had a chance. Yeah, because people always ask, well, why would they do it? They've been around God. They know how powerful he is. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he actually thought he could win a battle, although he was prepared to fight. Mm -hmm. I think he just wants another realm to be like God. Right. So that's what he's always saying. He wants to be like God. He wants another realm. 
And he was thinking that he could make a case, hey, we're not happy, so leave us alone and let us go into another world. But uh -huh. the trouble is is everything that he leads leads to destruction so yes it, it can't it just can't be permitted to happen so i look at all of that and then you have them saying okay that's not going to happen by the looks of it we are going to fight and with the powerful weapons and the power that they would have you could see why the earth would be destroyed exactly yes Right, And so it just starts to make things sort of come together if you just sort of let let the Bible kind of read in, in that sort of aspect. And so how it applies then when, when he finds out when the Adamites might be raised above the angels and might even be used to convict them is that Satan wants to get his revenge on humankind. And that's yes. why in Revelation 12, he deceives the entire world. Right. Right? And again, none of this stuff that we're talking about can be done by a human. Yes, it's just exactly. So many details. So I think Satan and, and, and Hale L, uh, I think erroneously called Lucifer, um, is uh, is the same individual and i think the other individuals that we're seeing talked about particularly in ezekiel and in isaiah uh, is part of that dual prophecy and there are several of those dual prophecies uh in, in the bible that work that way if you can just pick them out otherwise you're just going to look at it and say geez i think there's a contradiction there and and it can't mm -hmm. be and again my my belief is is you have to look at all of the uh the verses when it comes to Satan to to understand who he was, who he is, and how far he Absolutely. fell. Absolutely. And th and then I look at you know John eight, and you know it says the Satan is the murderer from the beginning. Right. And right. so so everybody says, well, okay, how does that fit in with the chronology? And again, you have to dig a little bit deeper. So if you look at the word beginning in that. That goes back to the Greek word arche, which means principle or rule, majesty of angels and demons, and created in the beginning, which now takes us back to Genesis right. 1, right? which again sort of places that creation of the angels back then and probably the rebellion back then, which causes the, 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 uh, the earth to be destroyed. And, you know, murderer... Uh, means slayer, as it translates out of, of Greek. So he is a slayer of perhaps the angels who rebelled that will be destroyed, as um, Psalms 82 says, or burn in the lake of fire. It's hard to know uh, what that means, but maybe it's the lake of fire where they're going to burn forever, where they're destroyed. Um, but I think, uh, I think, that makes him a murderer. And I also think because he is a liar from the beginning, he lies and deceives Eve and Adam to eat the fruit, which causes the fall and the right. first revenge against humans, yes. which makes him a murderer of all the humans who will not be saved because there was nothing in it as set out with the creation of Adam and that they should die because they had the fruit from the tree of life. So this is how he is a murderer from the beginning and then repeats as a murderer of humans through who he is, a liar. Yeah, I fully agree with you. Because, uh, you know, he also assumes the title as the angel of death. Um, and the reason being is because, in my opinion, I think it all goes back to Psalms 82 that when they are exiled and banished here to the earth, that this is when death comes into being and that they are the first ones to be put under the authority of death, even though their sentence is deferred for these 7,000 years of what would be the second world age, just as Cain is uh, given a reprieve of seven generations uh, that he would be murdered by Lamech, but that you know he would have a chance to um, to bring forth his bloodline, his seed line, uh, which is something that, you know, I teach that, you know, that he is the 
child of the wicked one, as it says in First John chapter 3, verse 12. But when we come back from break, we'll look a little bit further into this Isaiah 14, um, the mention of him as an abominable branch, and the Matthew 13, the illusion of uh, in the parable of the kingdom of him as being the enemy which snuck into the garden. Hey, Gary, I'm going to drop you and then bring you back on so we can get better connection. Okay. All right, thanks for that. We'll be right back, everyone. Apostles answered and said to the Savior, Our Lord, reveal to us the truth. Whom have you established in his place to sit on his throne and stand in the place of the accuser who was cast down? And please inform us how many angels are there in heaven, and tell us who is the greatest of them all, the one whom you have enthroned in the rank of the firstborn. The Savior answered and said, O oh, my chosen apostles, you are blessed, for you seek every kind of knowledge. It happened that when we cast the devil from heaven, my father commanded on the twelfth of Hathor at the hour of sunrise for the angels to assemble in his presence and stand before his throne on both sides. At that moment, he took a great and strong angel named Michael, he enthroned him on the throne in place of the firstborn, and the entire splendor which had been taken from Mastema was given to Michael. The diadem of the light of joy was placed on Michael's head. The staff of righteousness was given to Michael. The shoes of peace were placed on his feet. He was invested on the evening of the twelfth of Hathor, and he was established above the heavenly world of light and above the earthly world on the twelfth of Hathor, the enthronement of the archangel Michael, uh, which is an extra-biblical text which not a lot of people have heard about or read. But if you read it, it covers in great detail the fall of Lucifer and the casting down and how he was uh, replaced by Michael and how he had once been the firstborn, um, that was a title uh, because he was the first created archangel uh, um, and Michael being the second after he was cast down, he was replaced. So very interesting text. And I do include it in its full in my great contest book, The War in Heaven. Uh, but this is the second hour of our show. I'm your host, Zane Garcia. This is Momentary Zen, and I'm uh, honored to have as guests with me this evening, tomorrow evening, and next Thursday, Gary Wayne, author of the Genesis 6 Conspiracy. And so I hope that, um, you know, our reconnection clears up some of the um, some of the weirdness that was going on with the, because uh, I want you to come in clear. So hopefully everything will be good, but Gary, if you would, Please give out all of your website contact information once more and where people go to find your, your books. Yep, go to genesis6conspiracy.com. That's genesis6 with the number 6conspiracy.com where you can uh, get a signed copy or order uh, through a link from barnesandnoble.com or amazon.com or the Kindle link. And it's also my book is also available on most online bookstores, and it's also distributed by Bookmasters. So if you did want to support your local bookstore, um, and they don't have it on the shelf, then uh, they can order it in for you from Bookmasters. You can also follow me and contact me through Facebook uh, under Gary Wayne and at the Genesis Six Conspiracy. It's the Gary Wayne Genesis Six Conspiracy Group. And follow me on Twitter at GaryWayne63. And if you do get a hold of me with a question, I will get back to you. Excellent. Um, 
I'll start this segment with this particular passage from the Apocalypse of Abraham. It says, And I looked into the picture, and my eyes ran to the side of the Garden of Eden. I saw there a man of imposing height and mighty in stature, incomparable in aspect, and he was embracing a woman who likewise approximated to the aspect of his size and stature. And they were standing under a tree of the Garden of Eden, and the fruit of this tree was like a bunch of grapes of the vine. And standing behind the tree was one who had the aspect of a serpent, having hands and feet like those of a man, and wings on its shoulder, six pairs of wings, so that there were six wings on the right and six wings on the left. And as I continued looking, I saw the man and the woman eating the fruit from the tree. I said, who are those who are embracing, and who is the one between them, who is behind the tree, and what is the fruit that they are eating? And he said, this is the counsel of the world. This one is Adam, and this one who is their desire upon the earth is Eve. But he who is between them represents ungodliness and their beginnings on the way to perdition, even Azazel. And so this takes us again back to the story of the garden. And the reason I make mention of it and bring it up is because we see in Isaiah 14 that there is a reference to, in my opinion, that Lucifer, Satan, is spoken about as being an abominable branch. It says in verse 19, But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, and as the raiment of those that are slain thrust through with a sword that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Prepare slaughter for his children, for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. And I think this is also connected to what Yeshua was speaking about in Matthew 13, where he says, But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, meaning that word fruit is a, a perier, and it also is a reference to descendants, children, offspring, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And so, in my opinion, we see that at the very beginning in the garden, we have the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent that continues, as Yeshua says here, until the end, and that they survived the flood um, uh, and that they were spared, they were given a reprieve, a remnant of them was allowed to make it through the flood, and that the New World Order elites of today are those that are tied together and connected to the seed of Cain. And I know that most people take the seed of Cain and the seed of the serpent back to Genesis 6, but in my opinion, it is clear that it goes back to uh, Genesis 3.15, where we see uh, that God is speaking to the serpent, and he says to them that I will put enmity between thy seed and her seed, and between thy sons and her sons. And so... You know, again, whether you take it to Genesis 3 or Genesis 6, it's clear to me that there is a, a physical progeny of the devil here on the earth and that they have been waging war against the children of Adam since the very beginning and that this war is ongoing even to this day. And so if you would, Gary, what do you think about the abominable branch and the, the prophecy there in Isaiah 14? 
uh, prepare slaughter for his children. Yeah, I think uh, it also leads into to uh, a little bit further down in, in, in Isaiah, you know, the serpent's root. Right. And um, also, you know, its fruit's going to be basically a cockatrice, which is another viper or serpent. And you have, uh, you know, the production, uh, a pr uh, producing of this fiery serpent um, that goes back to seraph. And Right. So you have all of this serpentine imagery that is just always sort of weaving around throughout, um, of, you know, throughout the Bible. And you have, you know, also in the Psalms, in, in Psalms 21, you have these bloodlines that um, are going to be destroyed in the end time, just as what we're talking about in, in, in Matthew. So I think we have to look at quite seriously, and, you know, I do, in terms of there is a serpent's uh, seed that is talked about in 3.15, whether or not we're referring to Cain descendants that might have married into Nephilim, whether or not Cain is actually um, a product of of uh, Eve and uh, Satan, or Satan and Lilith. There's a few different variations on that. And, or is it Genesis 6, or is it all of it? Um, right. We have the serpent's root we have to contend with that, you know, ends up being the royal bloodlines and the, the, the dynasties and the kings of the earth, as it says in Daniel 2.43, you have the descendants of these metallic dynasties, you know, that come from the Nephilim, who are going to mix or mingle with the seed of humankind, right. the end time empire. So we know there is this seed that is, and this bloodline, and all of of these different verses that says that this is going to play out in the end time at the time when the angels are thrown out of heaven in Revelation 12 and all wrapped together in the destruction of Babylon in the destruction and in the Armageddon battle and the wrath bulls of being resolved in the end time and so uh, there's to me it's 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 just again it's watching how the totality of the Bible work in sort of you know perfect harmony um, exactly, yes. is just it's just astounding to me and uh, so and I think I, I I kind of butchered 1429 um, but but it says uh, you know for out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent and seraph is comes out of the word as the hebrew there for fiery and for serpent and you don't have seraph used that many times in the bible you've got it used in isaiah 6 and you've got it used in numbers 21 where moses uses um a seraph um at the top of his spear Whereas the serp all the other serpents, these venomous serpents that are talked about are all go back in the cash. And only seraph is referred to this brass bronze thing that goes on top of uh, the, the spear to cure the Israelites from the venomous serpents and to um, protect them. And then the other one is, is again, you have uh, fiery uh, serpents in, in uh, Deuteronomy 8.15. And again, fiery is is uh, seraph and the serpent part is the cash. And so there's a distinction between the cash and seraph. And certainly seraph is, is, is the singular form of seraphim. And I am generally uh, suggest ones as in a, in a male form, whereas AH tends to be the plural in the female form. So uh, I know I'm probably going down into the weeds a little bit on that, but I just want, again, to underline that this serpent imagery isn't just in one or two places in the Bible. It actually connects all the way through. And so when we're talking about the beasts of the empires in Daniel, 
or the beast as an antichrist, or the ten horn and the ten kings of the last beast empire. These are the wild beasts that howl. These are like the howlings, and howling is used a lot in the King James Bible, and in, in, in the Old Testament, and in Revelation, you see the word wailing, because basically howl and wailing are the same um, meaning out of Halal, and also understand that Hell, as we talked about as Satan, also roots back to uh, Yale and Halal as being a howling, so Satan is also a howling and we also know howling from the occult as being changeling type of gods and demigods that follow satan and so you have all of these kings that come out of these metallic empires whether or not it's in jeremiah 50 and 51 or isaiah uh, howling and wailing at the destruction of babylon in the end time and at armageddon and it's all connected because they're the same types of beings and the offspring and the descendants of those beings. Right, right. Yes, exactly. And so, you know, and again, for those that have not studied or examined or looked into this, it sounds just completely bizarre and impossible. But yet Yeshua references even the Pharisees as the children of this bloodline. He calls them a den of vipers. And we see that Satan, Lucifer, um, going back to the garden, the serpent, the Nakash, uh, which beguiled Eve, it's all the imagery of the dragons, the seraphim, the seraph, uh, all throughout scripture, and not just in scripture. I had made mention of the emerald tablets previously. There's a passage um, that I made mention of. It says, in the form of man, they amongst us, but only to sight were they as our men, serpent-headed when the glamour was lifted, but appearing to man as men among men, crept they into the council, taking forms that were like unto men, and slaying by their arts the chiefs of the kingdom, taking their form, they rule over man. And sought they from the kingdom of shadows to destroy man and rule in his place. I mean, that fits right along with Daniel. Uh, they will intermingle themselves among the seed of men. And so we see all throughout scripture and the extra biblical text and also the mythological text. And even the, uh, the, the Nagamati codices, the mention of the archons. Uh, in the Sumerian mythology, the Anunnaki, these dragon-like angels, um, these feathered serpent beings that were worshipped all throughout the antediluvian and the prior times all over the world. In my opinion, it's all tied to the same fantastic story uh, that we see revealed within the scriptures. Um, Gary, comment on that? Well, yeah, when you envision what a dragon is it's a flying serpent and it was right. known as that in antiquity and then when you envision that they're putting feathers on dinosaurs for flying dinosaurs right, right. Um, now you can envision um, the plume serpent or the feathered serpent as a seraphim angel that's yes. the god it was the watcher right and people you know refer to watchers out of uh, the book of Enoch, but, you know, Daniel also refers to uh, these watchers, which are angels in, in, I think, Daniel 4. So it does show up in the Bible, and the watchers are thought to be the seraphim angels and the same ones who created the uh, Nephilim in uh, Genesis 6-4. And so you also have the Nagas in India, and you have yes. the dragon creation gods in China and this imagery of serpentine and dragon gods are all over the world it is a common legacy so there's something to this in terms of the looks in terms of where the pantheon comes from around the world and there are often depicted in the early period as serpentine and that the imagery of kings were always surrounded by these serpent things because that's 
that's what they look like as being the offspring of of, of the seraphs, and also their co their their creators look like serpents. And I think when we understand and that this imagery is so constant all around the world, we have to we have to put an emphasis emphasis on it that this isn't just a uh, Twilight Zone conversation. It's recorded everywhere. And the coincidence is just inexplicable not to be true. And then I look at, you know, I mentioned Luke 10, 18 earlier, you know, as backing up Satan falling from heaven as what Jesus said and using what Jesus said. And I'm going to quote 10, 18 and 19 together because, again, it's really quite interesting when you put it together. It says in 10, 18, and he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And then in 10, 19, and I always like to put 19 together with 18. It says, behold, I give you, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and right. scorpion, and, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall be, nothing shall by any means hurt you. So we've got serpents and scorpions and the power of the enemy grouped together in the imagery that's hooked into Satan as the dragon and the serpent, um, and all the descriptions we talked about in, in the first part of the show, and spoken about by Jesus just as the parable of the terrors that you were talking about is talking about this this abominable branch that grows amongst us and will also be taken care of in the end time. Yes. And I also note scorpions in there because what comes out of the abyss in the end time along with a bad and, a, and or a poly. And so these, these and we get a, a tradition out of the scorpion gods out of Sumerian history, and they're called the Gurdabalu or the Akrababalu, and they're created by Tiamat. And their, their descriptions are exactly what Revelation 9 describes. So I wonder whether or not this is another, it's either a demigod or a creation of, of the angels, or and it's a protector of the gods uh, in, in the Sumerian pantheon, and also a protector of the, of the sun temples after Tiamat dies. And Tiamat is, you know, connecting the, the connections here again, the dots, is like Lotan or, or Leviathan in Sumerian in, in Middle East history. It's that serpent type being again, right? right? So all of these things are just so common and interwoven that it's just astounding when you start putting it all together. Right. And again, in my opinion, every word in the Bible is very important. And when you go to the original languages, as far as the Hebrew and the Greek, they also give you further insight into all the things that we're talking about. Uh, because the language is specific, and there's deeper, more profound meaning to all of these connections and all of these uh, serpentine uh, seraph references that it's not just flowery language or uh, metaphorical. It is uh, it has a basis in reality and a connection to not only the ancient mythologies, but also to what we see reflected even in the oral traditions. Because uh, uh, as we said and as we've been talking about uh, and as we've done other shows previous, uh, we talked about how the feathered serpent they were worshipped worldwide during the antediluvian age and even now. Uh, and even during Daniel's time, we see that, you know, some of these um, ancient serpents were worshipped in Babylon in the, the story of Bell and the dragon. Um, and that we see that, you know, the, the intermingling of these archonic, Anunnaki, uh, fallen angelic gods with the the daughters of Cain and creating these hybrid races, uh, that in the mythology we see um, even Barosus makes mention of all the different types of hybrid creatures and beings that came forth from the copulation of these particular beings with that of the 
the daughters of Cain. Um, the book of the giants speaks about the miscegenation. And then we see in the mythology, the mention of all of these demigodic uh, men of renown, uh, these mythological hero type individuals that had supernatural ability and capacity. And then we see the celebration of all of their travels and adventures. And we call all of that mythology. But again, the mythology has a basis in reality. And we see when you can understand the parallel accounts and how it ties together with what is being referenced and revealed within the scripture, then the underlying truth, which connects all of them, comes forth and is just, as we said, the most incredible and fantastic story that one can ever come together and come to understanding upon. Yeah, and when we look at some of these gods out of Sumeria, um, you know, there's a you know a common sort of thought that you've got uh, these these uh, Anunnaki that look like birds, which we've right. got depictions of, um, and then these fish gods like Dagon, which would be of the Philistines and Oannes, uh, uh, but out of uh, the Mesopotamia area, but there's a lot of experts that say that it shouldn't be translated as fish. It should be translated more as reptilian. And so right. that boils it back in into sync with what we see around the world where you have kind of like lion gods, you have these bird gods, and you have uh, these serpentine gods. And so it's also interesting that you get a line of, lion people that show up as mighty men in the bible with the gadites who seem to intermarry with uh whoever <laughs> this branch is and also there's the lion men of moab that are that are also killed and so that goes back to you know ariel as you know in 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 hebrew and in outside the bible ariel is is you know the the lion uh the uh Angel, uh, means lion and lion of God. And so is credited for creating another line of Nephilim beings that look like lions. This mm -hmm. is sort of how that goes. And then you have these bird-like creatures of the Anunnaki who uh, have a, a counterpart in India and in Japan called the Tango. And again, they also produce this warrior king class, just as you have the Sings, which is the lion class and warrior class in India, and the Nagas, which are the offspring of the gods as well. Well, but the serpentine likes also being the gods. And you have the Tengu in Japan and India, which are the bird-like ones. And then you have like the Thunderbird demigods of the, of the Native Americans. So it's like you have these three main groupings of these beings um, that come from similar type of gods, maybe just different orders and classifications other than the seraphs that also uh, violated the laws of creation in and we get a god in Egypt called Bast, which is famous for the being, uh, you know, the creator or connected back to. And I haven't seen in the movie you have the Black Panther, but that's the god that is cited there. This was a lion or a cat uh, depicted god. And in Egyptian mythology and history and religion, she kind of opened Pandora's box and created all of these. Uh, types of fabulous beasts in prehistory, whether it's the mermaids or, or whatever. Um, but she just lists in, in it lists of all the ones that she made. So it sounds like the same story being told, and similar gods that are doing different things around the world, but creating different lines of these nephilim type beings. And uh, and also known as, you know, if you're looking, trying to figure out who Nephilim are in, in the body, you know, look for giants because in the King James Version, it's going to go back to Nephilim in Hebrew in giant in Genesis 6, 4, and also in Numbers 13, 33, twice. And then all the other words for giant is going to go back to Rapha, which is the root word for Raphaim in plural. And giant is used all the way through to the time of Goliath, who uh, 
was uh, if you take in the King James Version, um, giant back, it's going to say Rapha as well. In other translations, it'll just say uh, Rapha. And so Rapha is part of the Anakim. In fact, the Anakim of Numbers 21 that I was just talking about are called the descendants of the giants or the Nephilim. And the Anakim in Deuteronomy 2 are said to be part of the Raphaim. So they're all connected. But the point of the matter is, is, is these giants are all throughout the Old Testament. And then you get the associated descriptive word called Gibberim, describing them as the mighty ones or the mighty men. And Gibberim is used 158 times in the Old Testament, not always to describe a giant. Um, sometimes, a couple times, it describes um, uh, an angel, as in the Psalms and Isaiah, and it also will describe um, the angel of God uh, as is also as a mighty one and God as a mighty one. So you have to be careful when you see mighty one that doesn't always refer to, to uh, giants. It can refer to angel and to Jesus and or to God. So in as a descriptive manner. So where you see mighty one, get the red flags up because that could be pointing you in a different direction than, than what you thought. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that is another one of the most incredible aspects of the scriptures is the connecting links with, again, this war between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman, we see that these giants, which was a completely different race, not just, you know, very tall human beings, but six-fingered, six-toed, double sets of teeth, uh, massive stature, very supernatural strength, and, you know, the whole capacity of the uh, the hero, the men of renown, uh, the connections with the population of the sons of God, with the daughters of Cain, um, that we see even in the archaeological record, the geological record, that the giants and skeletons being found all over the world here in America during the pioneer time when the land was being taken from the Native Americans and being uh, farm, there were all these stone structures and mound-like structures where giant skeletons were said to have been found in all these ancient uh, township the newspapers and uh, city newspapers all throughout uh, history, the history of America. Um, and so these kind of things, even though they sound fantastical, they, again, they are very much connected to truth and our ancient past and the skeletons of giants and even skulls with horns, um, that these kind of things, skeletons as large as uh, you know, 20, 30 feet uh, tall, have been found all over the world. And there's recently um, people, I don't know if you've heard or looked into this, uh, Gary, but a lot of people have been telling me about the work of Mud Fossils University, and he speaks about how um, a lot of these mountainous structures and these stone structures and what seems to be like almost like petrified wood, um, that these particular strange anomalous structures seem to be um, the leftover remains of giants from a previous age. Um, have you looked into that, and do you have any comment on that? Yeah, I have looked into it. It's a very interesting research on it. Very um, intriguing. I think uh, very intriguing. I think they need to be a little bit more stricter and not going off on too many right, uh, right. rabbit holes, so to speak, on it. But there's there, there's there's something there that uh, is, you know, from the size of the trees. And, you know, again, not every... You know, a rock mountain is a giant skeleton right. or a giant tree, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's more going on there than, you know, than you can explain. And you can't explain these perfect sort of uh, hexagon shapes that are, you know, in the formation of what looks like a tree stump, right? Yes. Or in the pathway of the gods, uh uh, of the giants, I mean, over in, in Ireland, you've got those things that are just, it's like a road built out of it. So, right. uh, and it just doesn't occur naturally like they say. So I think it's part of the puzzle that, 
that is being hidden and, and the history that's being hidden so that people are more easily deceived until they're ready to uh, mm-hmm. totally uh, brainwash them and have them rebel uh, in, you know, in the end time. So, yeah, no, I, I certainly would not uh, dismiss uh, any of that whatsoever because, uh you know, the the more you you dig into these types of things, is the the more uh, you realize like how asleep was I before I started to dig into this stuff. Mm-hmm. And right. you know, I look at things very very critically. And so for me to say these things, at least in, from my perspective and my opinion, is it's it's just stunning um, how far the rabbit hole actually goes on what's being hidden and being. Mi- how we're being misled about history. So, but it's all for the, you know, the deception of the, of the end time. There's no doubt about that in my mind. And you were talking about these giant skeletons that are found and, and cataloged in newspapers. Yes. From about 1850, right through to about the 1950s. And I post those every once in a while, because there's just so many. And some of them are right. only seven feet tall, but some of them like in Texas are as big as, 18 feet tall and so lots of them are nine and 10 and 11 and 12 feet tall and two things happen to them i mean um they're either sent to a local university and then they went to the smithsonian or they went directly to the smithsonian and then they're never heard of again but you have this newspaper record of it and most of them had red hair which again is consistent with my research on the nephilim because Mm -hmm. least of the ones that were around the Mediterranean area, either had hazel eyes and red hair or blonde hair and blue eyes. Blue eyes and yeah. so you have these red haired ones that, that we see in North America and with the Peruvian skulls. And some of the testing coming back is taking that back through Ireland and Scotland and then back to Scythia, which is where a lot of the occult believe Tartarus was located and that the Aryans and the the Titans that were locked in there after the Titan Rebellion came out after the flood. Gods like Gog and Magog and Albion would be amongst those ones that came out of there. So there's, again, all of these different connections that just keep going back and telling us the same story about the same events and it is just inexplicable and and to me, you just it's not rational to just shove it aside. Uh, at some point in time, it becomes mathematically impossible to have all that many coincidences. Right. And right. I put that together again, saying that just as you were talking about, you know, in, in Matthew 13 with the tares and, and the weeds, that, you know, they're going to be amongst us right through to the harvest, the end yes. time. Yes, yes. And we, we also see that in, you know, in Psalm 21 about this, because, you know, it says, um, in, it says, thou shalt make them as a fiery oven in time of thine anger, and the Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath. The wrath is in the end time, and the fire shall devour them. Their fruit shall thou destroy from the earth, and their seed from among the children of men yes for they intended evil against thee they imagined a mischievous device which they are not able to perform so again all the language and the intent of the passage is going to bloodlines and or survivors uh, whether they're pure bloods or recreations of them after the flood and, and right through to the end time. So we're going to be impacted by these beings that are going to show who they are in the end time. And when we talk about what the end time is going to look like, it's hard to imagine how utterly unworldly of what we know today is what we're going to be told and what we're going to see. It's going to shake everybody's beliefs break to the bone unless you understand the Bible and understand it well. It's even the elect will be deceived if that were possible as we're told in prophecy. Right, absolutely. Um, There's one particular passage as well that, in my opinion, and this was one of those that when I understood the context of what was being revealed here by Christ, uh, it absolutely affirmed to me those things that we're speaking about now. and it, I'll begin in 
verse 30, it says, And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, ye be witnesses unto yourselves that ye are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill ye up then the measure of your fathers, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers. How can ye escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zacharias son of Barachias, whom ye slew between the temple and the altar. And so we know that Zacharias was the father of John the Baptist, who was killed in the Holy of Holies during this, you know, the time of Christ, um, and that they killed John also, who was the rightful, would have been the high priest after his father. But here, I mean, telling us from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zacharias, it was Cain who killed Abel. And so these serpents, these generation of vipers, in my opinion, there's no denying that they are connected to Cain and their, his particular bloodline because um, he was the murderer of Abel. And so they are, and they have always practiced assassination. They do it even now, uh, these particular bloodlines. And they were the ones that even conspired his murder and put him to the cross, and you know, and incited uh, Pilate to do so. And so they've always been the murderer of the prophets. Comment? Yeah, and, and, and when somebody sees serpents and vipers or words like that being used, you need to understand those are marker words and yes. they're used consistently. And they're either going to describe a physical relationship or an allegorical or spiritual relationship so when you know jesus is talking to them as you know you know basically a generation of vipers um i don't believe he's saying that all of you know judah is descendant from the nephilim right, I, I don't right. believe that but yes. i also know that there are um like the kenites who were part of the scribes right that mm -hmm. were taken right. in and i also know there was uh, the Gibeonites, um, who were Hivim, um, that were the temple slaves that were, you know, fooled Joshua and yes, he made exactly. a covenant or an oath with them, right? right? And so we do have some of this within Judah and within the actual temple aspect. So whether or not that's being referred to or a spiritual one, it's hard to know, but it is still one of the same thing in terms of the ultimate end, whether or not you're a spiritual serpent or a physical serpent in carrying in the ways of Cain and in Satan and, and uh, the seraphim angels like Azazel. So I think it's important to understand that, that, that those connections are there, you know, for, for a reason. And Absolutely. I also... Yeah, and so I, I just we 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 have to be aware of all of these types of imagery that is out there that is just sort of being in our face, and we're not really understanding what it's all about. Whether or not it's like vampires that go back to dragons and nephilim and the blood drinking, or the mm -hmm. fairies, which goes back to, you know, some people probably don't realize that there's four classifications of fairies, and one of them is led by the proud angel who led a rebellion and created like the Tuatha De Nan as the demigod nephilim as as the offspring and that um, the fairy allegory is the matriarchal bloodline as in um, as the dragon is the patriarchal bloodline of the descendants of the or the, the seeds of the serpent and owl and raven are the other allegory owl which is reminiscent of you know Isaiah 34 and also Lilith where mm -hmm. Lilith is also used in in, in the original Hebrew as an owl that hops like a like a goat and 
you have uh, the raven, which is, to me, looks like that Anunnaki bird-like character. Right. Right? Right. Exactly. Which is one of those gods that we're talking about. And so these are the bloodlines that they use the allegories in their own world to describe. Right. So anytime you see fairy or owl, an owl as in Bohemian Grove or, or raven, and that's always part of the occult, or the dragon or the vampire, these are all reflective of the bloodlines that they track. And they, they track their genealogies, you know, and, and that's mm -hmm. why I think Antichrist is, you know, called a beast. He's going to have, have the pedigree of the Nephilim blood. And again, all the allegories will come together, uh, as in the beast empires, as in the beast kings, as in the wild beasts of Isaiah and of Jeremiah. These are they're all talking about the same type of individuals, and you'll always will see howling and mighty men around that word and terminology. Absolutely. Uh, we're getting to the last part, of, but I want to ask you about this. Um, one other passage in the Emerald Tablets, um, it says, Far in the past before Atlantis existed, men there were who delved into darkness, using dark magic, calling up beings from the great deep below us. Forth came they into this cycle, formless were they of another vibration, existing unseen by the children of Earthmen. Only through blood could they have formed being." Only through man could they live in the world. I wanted to ask you about the connections with the elites doing these blood rituals. And do you think that, um, because some people like Princess Diana, she says that if they don't consume the blood or if they don't um, uh, you know, pre uh, keep these rituals, that they will show their true form, which is, according to her, this lizard-like, reptilian-like, serpent-like form. And so do you think that this is why, uh, possibly why they continue to practice these cannibalism and the drinking of blood in order to hold on and to keep the hidden, this supernatural form? Certainly possible, and also maybe why they also created blood banks as another supply but mm -hmm. that's another rabbit hole right right uh, the other reasons for the other reasons you know listed for drinking blood is that it increases their, their um, mental and cognitive abilities and also extends their life and it's, it's also a tradition that the ancient nephilim did to right. do the same thing after yeah their uh, lifespan was shortened uh, in, in the physical world by God in Genesis 6 again. Mm -hmm. And so this is a sin of the Nephilim and a tradition that they carry on. But you know that it's probably not just a tradition just to do, right. uh, you know, as an exercise uh, of their power that they're, they would expect to get something out of it. And I think that's a distinct possibility because... Uh, we don't know whether or not they have a shape-shifting ability or they're doing something to suppress it. Certainly their procreators were, were, had shape-shifting capabilities to take a form of any shape they wanted in this world. Yes. Um, you know, because they're spirit beings from another dimension and, and, and they show up in all sorts of forms in, in, in the Bible from men to shining beings. So uh, I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot to that. Um, and certainly it's always been part of the occult rituals and of course these blood drinking and blood sacrifice rituals tend to only happen at the adept and higher levels so it's the true elite as you're getting into sort of the pure bloods and certainly the Windsors would be one of the leading candidates of pure bloodlines of intermarriage that would present antichrist going forward so I'm um, not saying that it's coming out of the Windsor line um, but they would be a leading candidate with a, when you look, look at the pedigree of those those bloodlines. And there's going to be many antichrists in the end time, but only right. one is going to rise to be true antichrist. So I think right. we're going to see competing competing antichrists from many bloodlines from from around the world, all striving for the same. Um, I wanted to also throw in, you know, as we talk about just something else. When I say things are all around us and we don't really know it and you're talking about the emerald tablet 
you know, as one source of ancient knowledge and, Mm -hmm. you know, and we've got words like pearls of wisdom and archives of the masons and the emerald tablet, the golden fleece, tablets of destiny, golden apples, halls, hall of records, the Smargdina Hermetes, the table of ham, the rainbow treasure, and on and on and on, the Shatia, these are all referring to this ancient sort of bank of knowledge. And one of those ones that I said was archives in there. And archive means, you know, hidden treasures, you know, as in the chamber of the archives or the archives of the Masons. And archive um, is sort of this ancient occult word that goes back. And if people were listening earlier, I mentioned that Lucifer was also, or Satan was also um, described in his various names to be, as you take that back to Greek, an ark, right? And where ark and archive come from, uh, mm, you know, from the r- root word archa, or a box or a chest of any, of something that's hidden, something that's also comes from ark is arcane. And then the uh, Lucifer is thought to live, in the in a house called Archaon, and so you have he's also known in Freemasonry as the great architect of the universe. He's also known by them as the uh, great Archon of mysticism. And this is just one of those examples of how this meaning is thrown out there by them. And we don't even know it, and we're using their occult words and stuff all of the time. We just don't realize it. Wow. Now, I also know there's also an ark that's a boat. So, uh, mm-hmm. but this is a different route than, than 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 that. So, in terms of its etymology. Wow, that was a uh, fascinating, and yeah, the rabbit trail just rabbit trail just keeps expanding uh, every which way, and yeah, as you said, you know, we. Well, yeah. Uh, and, yeah, go ahead. And what's poignant on it is, is the Freemasons, they developed the fifth science called geometry, which they call masonry, and they build architecture for the great architect of the universe. And part of why they developed the secret societies and the sciences was to honor their pantheon of God with uh-huh. these structures. And early on in the show, you were mentioning these ancient structures that were built from the knowledge that came from the gods as well as the seven sacred sciences to accelerate those sciences where geometry comes from to build this architecture, whether it's Stonehenge or the pyramids and on and on and on. This is absolutely part of their history and it's everywhere. And we just don't realize what they're talking about. Right. Yeah, and as we had mentioned before, I think that they are reconstructing stuff that they had seen uh, in the heavens, you know, with regard to the pyramid structures, the ziggurat and all of that. Final comment, Gary. No, I think we've covered a lot. I didn't get into uh, with Satan that I think that the order of Melchizedek is an order that is created uh, to replace Satan's fall as priest. And uh, I always note in Hebrews that it says about uh, Melchizedek is that he's made in the likeness of Jesus and he has no parents in Hebrews 7. And he's without a genealogy with no beginning or end like an Alpha or Omega. And his name means the King of Righteousness, which Jesus is called. And this is the order that Jesus is anointed into just as Satan was anointed as as guardian cherub um, before his fall and that he is worthy because he is he, he is eternal and he is sworn in by the oath of god and so i just think that everything is about what happened with satan his fall why humans were created and how this is all part of that interaction all throughout our history and will be right through the end time until the order of Melchizedek comes to be for us. Awesome, Gary. Thank you, brother. We'll talk to you tomorrow night. God bless everyone. Good night. Shalom.
listening to Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. We'll be right back after this message. 